Since the dawn of the church, millions of Christians have given up their lives rather than give up their faith. To be a religious martyr is to be so secure in your beliefs that even the threat of death isn't a deterrent. And although it's often associated with Roman persecution of early Christians, martyrdom is still happening to this day. Welcome to Mysteries of the Church. I'm your host, Carolyn Morrison. In this episode, we look into the history of Christian martyrdom and the lives of those who made the ultimate sacrifice for what they believe. Even in the face of torture and crucifixion, Jesus refused to relent to his persecutors. His willingness to sacrifice himself for the sake of mankind is not only a cornerstone of Christian faith, but is also a source of fortitude for those who would later die in his name. These martyrs as we know them have brought about awe and inspiration to the faithful over the centuries. In the simplest terms, a martyr is a person who witnesses in, the, in a religious context, it's a person who is witnessing to his or her faith and is willing to do so despite the cost. They are true, authentic people who live and are willing to pay the price for what they believe in, even their very lives. But I, I'm also o often struck by the beautiful preface in um, when we celebrate the Feast of a Martyr. Um, the preface to the Eucharistic prayer says, um, Lord, you choose the weak and you make them strong in bearing witness to you. And I think that's such a beautiful way of expressing it, um, that you know, in and of, of themselves, of their own power, um, these men and women would have never been able to sacrifice their lives. It is the power of Christ in choosing them and making them strong in being able to do this. And um, as you're aware, it is the blood of the martyrs that is the lifeblood you know, of our church and the foundation of our church. And, and that it continues to this day, that there are men and women year in and year out that are martyred um, for, for what, they, what they believe in. Tradition tells us that all but John were martyred, and, and in really gruesome ways. Uh, Peter was crucified in Rome upside down. He didn't believe he was worthy to be crucified the way the Lord was. So he, he demanded that the, the cross be turned upside down, and that's how he died. Uh, other saints were, were flayed, actually. Other saints were beheaded. As we look at the New Testament, we see especially the role of the martyrs increasing along with St. Stephen, who is the proto-martyr or the first martyr, an absolutely fascinating person, the first deacon and the first martyr of the church. It's interesting that when we celebrate the feast liturgically of St. Stephen, it's December 26th, it's the day after Christmas Day, December 25th, almost reminding us in that gentle, kind little scene of the Nativity on December 25th that the ultimate witness to Christ is the birth of the martyr. We go from the white and, and glory of Christmas to the red of the martyr. And again, as the fathers of the church say, the seed of, of Christians is the blood of martyrs. It helps spread the faith. When we come back, why the first 300 years of the church is also known as the age of martyrdom. Welcome back to Mysteries of the Church. The most critical time for Christianity was right from the beginning. Not only were Christians becoming alienated from their Jewish brethren, the evangelization of the new faith often brought about persecution from the Roman rulers. In fact, the treatment of Christians at the hands of the Romans was so brutal that the first 300 years of the Church is also known as the Age of Martyrdom. Christ chose the apostles and sent them forward to preach the good news of, of the kingdom of God, to preach really the fact that he is the Lord, he is risen from the dead, triumphing over sin and death. Each of the apostles met with martyrdom in unique ways, with the exception 
of John the Evangelist. The first um, martyr is um, a Saint Stephen um, who, who uh, suffered a terrible death um, in being stoned to death. Um, there were some Jews at the time who um, just saw him as a threat. Um, and um, like most times um, when you, we see people as a threat, um, whether in a direct way or in an indirect way, we just want to, um, to uh, marginalize them or get them out of the way. And that's exactly what they attempted to do to Stephen, accusing him of, uh, of idolatry, um, which was not the truth. So there were false accusations, and it's often compared in, to, to, to the death of Christ and the false accusations that were brought up against Christ. And of course, Stephen defended himself, but you know, made no excuses for what he was preaching, for he was preaching the truth, as Christ made no excuses for his life. There appears to have been situations in which stonings were allowed, to stone someone was allowed, if it was in the midst of a blasphemy or the breaking of the law. We see that with the woman caught in adultery. It would appear that, that the, the same rationale would be used towards someone like Stephen who appeared to be blaspheming against Jewish beliefs. Stoning as we think about it wasn't just picking up a little rock and flinging it at someone. It was a very horrific thing. You'd corner someone and you'd pick up huge pieces of stone and rock and hurl it at them until they died. He died a horrific, horrific death, and all because he refused to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. The persecution of Christians at the hands of the Roman Empire didn't end until the fourth century under the rule of Constantine, the first Christian emperor. Ultimately, the strategy of threatening Christians with the penalty of death didn't work. In fact, stories of martyrdom only strengthened the church by inspiring more people to the faith. When we return, we look at the lives of two celebrated martyrs, St. Peter and Joan of Arc, and later on, how the martyrdom of Christians continues to this day. Out of the Twelve Apostles, it was Peter who was chosen to lead the church after the crucifixion of Jesus. Peter knew that in order for Christianity to survive, efforts had to be made to convert those beyond the Jewish society within the ancient holy lands of the Middle East. Tradition holds that Peter, along with the Apostle Paul, set off to Rome to establish their church. The Romans basically were a very conservative society. It was built on a philosophy that was ages old, and also it was very much hierarchical. So anything new was by its nature suspicious. And the earliest Christians were persecuted both by the Jews, but much more by the Romans. They had three objections to the earliest Christians. First, they considered it to be a superstition, something new, fandangled, therefore it had to be put out of existence. Secondly, it threatened the stability of Roman society because it was all built upon appeasing their Roman gods. You come in with this new God, how do we even consider appeasing that God? And lastly, in broad terms, uh, the Romans by and large could not understand the secretive nature, as they understood it, of Christianity. As we look to this particular time period in the early church, it was a very volatile period. People were very unsettled. You had one group, the way, as it was called before the, the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. On the other hand, you had people in the Jewish religion who wanted to preserve their faith. They wanted to go forward and make sure that the faith that they knew, the faith that they grew up in, their faith tradition, wasn't eradicated by this new radical way of thinking. The attempt by several Roman emperors to go after the Christians was not so much Christians themselves, but a way to bring order and structure and, and control back into the Roman community. The, um, the Christians uh, posed no direct threat to the, to the Romans, but they were the outsiders, they were the new ones, and they were easy to go after. In the early church, St. Peter is the foundation of, uh, of the leadership of the church. We see that in scripture when Peter is either given the primary uh, number in the listing of the apostles, or when there are three apostles, Peter is the one in the middle. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, Peter's shadow, his mere shadow, cures people. He is clearly seen as the leader. In the uh, Council of Jerusalem, 
in 49 or 50. It's, it's very important in the two um, explanations or presentations of that council, one in Acts and one in Galatians, Peter is the main character in each of those. So it's very clear that the, the, the church sees Peter as the person that Jesus has said, you follow me. Uh, he goes to Rome in the midst of his, um, his evangelization, his reaching out, his, his going out through the whole world, and it's there that he is uh, swept up by the Romans and is, is crucified, the most one of the most brutal ways to die. And, as, and what he requests, however, is that he doesn't have the right to die the way his Lord did, so he, he demands that the, the crucifix be turned upside down, and tradition tells us that's how he died. Another account of martyrdom involves the remarkable life of a peasant girl who would rise up to become a brilliant military leader and heroine of French nationalism, all before the age of 20. The story of St. Joan of Arc is set against the backdrop of the Hundred Years' War, a conflict over French sovereignty between France and England that spanned the 14th and 15th centuries. Joan of Arc was born in January uh, 1412 and Joan was born to very pious parents in the region of Don Remy in the Lorraine section of France. And from an early age, she begins, she says, to hear voices. And the voices she hears belong to St. Michael the Archangel, St. Catherine, and St. Margaret. And at first, what she's hearing, these messages that she's hearing, they're very general. But over the years, they become more and more specific, and they're addressed directly to her. The idea that you heard voices that demanded that you go forth and, and fight, a young maiden go out and fight the, 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 Brit the English in the midst of a war is an absurdity. But within the time period that it was there, um, people believed that this was a real possibility. The interesting thing about Joan of Arc is that the proof is in the pudding. Here's a, a young girl, a teenager at best, who goes on to be a great symbol within France in this battle against uh, their, their mortal enemies, the British. She plays a very important role also in, in World War II for the French as this great symbol of the, of the maiden of France who was, was drawn by the Lord to, to fight for righteousness. At age 16, Joan claimed to have received instructions from God through visions of the saints Catherine, Michael, and Margaret to reclaim the French homeland from the occupying British. Through circumstances and perseverance, she was able to convince the dethroned King Charles VII to send her to Orleans, where the French army was laying siege to the occupied city. Much to her credit, the French was victorious and the city was reclaimed. A successive series of military victories under her leadership eventually led to the re-crowning of Charles VII as the King of France. In 1430, Joan was captured while traveling through a hostile region of France and was sold to the English. Her claims of being commanded by God to oppose England, another Christian nation, led to her trial and subsequent conviction for heresy. At the age of 19, Joan of Arc was sentenced to be burned at the stake. It was essential for the English to have her recant, because as you know, the English are, are just as Christian as the, uh, the French are and the idea that somehow God would favor the French over the English uh, would be just an abomination and incomprehensible to the English. So it was very important for them to discredit this, this messenger of God uh, the best way they could. And therefore, her motivation was not essentially political. Her motivation was religious. She felt she was being called through these saints by the Lord to do this. And even if she didn't fully understand why, because the Lord asked was sufficient for her to do what she did. Now, of course, the English had a problem. Because she was successful, how do you explain her success? There was always an attempt, anytime you wanted to kill somebody, whether it's the Romans or the, um, the English or the French or whoever it is, there's two things you're looking for. One is some kind of justice with the person who's losing their life, but the other is an example to others to say this is not something you want to continue on or something to repeat. Being burned at the stake is literally being roasted alive. Uh, the way in which it's usually done is that the fire is, is around the individual and, and an oven of, of heat is created and usually the person is dead long before their body burns. Uh, it's a gruesome way to die and it's a gruesome way to watch someone die. I think it was a way for them to, to get rid of this nuisance but also to make sure 
anybody who wanted to follow in her footsteps what the price would be for them. Not only would Joan of Arc be exonerated and declared a martyr by the church in 1920, nearly 500 years after her death, she would be canonized as a saint under Pope Benedict XV. When we come back, modern day martyrs and the tragic story of Archbishop Oscar Romero. You may be surprised to know that more Christians have been persecuted over the last century than any other, including any century during the Roman Empire. The war-torn Middle East has produced thousands of Christian refugees, while the communist regimes in places like China force Catholics to worship in secret, even to this day. And tragically, where there is religious persecution, there are martyrs. We continue to have martyrs to this day. If you look throughout the world, particularly in areas that are not primarily Christians, there are people who are very much uh, under the persecution of governments. It may be done the way it was in the Roman days. It may be done through economic um, disadvantages that are put in their way. It may be done in keeping them from uh, the political or power structures that, are, that, that, that other citizens would have access to. But to this day, we still see Christians being killed for the only reason of being Christian. I would say the vast majority of martyrs, be they in the past or present, are men and women who we do know nothing about. Um, we even think of the saints. Uh, you know, we know about the canonized. The saints have been canonized by the church. When we look at the situation, they are martyrs every single day. They are red martyrs, those that shed their blood in witness to the faith, and they are white martyrs, people that simply live good, happy, healthy, holy lives, and because of that are rejected, because of that suffer. One of the most resounding instances of modern day martyrdom happened during the political turmoil and violence of the Central American country of El Salvador during the 1980s. In 1977, the Vatican appointed Oscar Romero as Archbishop of the capital city, San Salvador. When civil war broke out in 1980, Romero became an outspoken advocate for poor El Salvadorians, who he believed were victims of human right violations at the hands of the ruling government. In my opinion, Oscar Romero is a perfect example of a contemporary martyr, although he hasn't been given that title uh, necessarily by the church yet. If you look at the situation of El Salvador in 1980, there was a great tension that was going on um, between uh, different forces that were uh, looking for political power. Nothing new there. But in the midst of it, the, 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 the Indians, the, the, the poor, the weakest of the community were being forgotten and being used as pawns within this great debate. Oscar Romero, who started off a, a bookwormish scholar and one that never really was uh, perceived as going to be any great shakes anywhere, uh, all of a sudden had some kind of conversion, a, a metanoia, if you will. And it was at that point throughout the late 70s that you see him dedicating his life to the poorest of the poor. He is not only a martyr, but in many ways he's a prophet, in my own way of seeing it. Because in an age in El Salvador where death squads basically were governmental rule, People lived in tremendous fear, and these villains and these outlaws basically took life at will. He stood as a prophet to say that this is wrong. And not only is it wrong, but he called every baptized Christian and Catholic to task if they had anything to do with that sort of repression, because it violated the very norms, the very basic foundation of their baptism in the church. On March 24, 1980, Oscar Romero was assassinated while celebrating mass at a small chapel in an El Salvadorian hospital. A United Nations report would later conclude that the perpetrators were from a death squad, backed by the government. Romero was using basic Catholic social teachings to preach the gospel and also to defend what he thought and what, he, uh, what, what it appeared to be the rights of the people during that time period. So he also was celebrating the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass when he was killed. So there is a fairly strong case 
to declare that Archbishop Romero one day might be declared a martyr, officially declared a martyr of the church, and might one day be declared a saint of the church. Like Stephen, like Paul, like most men and women who are martyred, they are threatening to the status quo, not just to stand up against um, the authority of the powers that be, but when there is an injustice present there. And he saw that injustice, and he stood up against that injustice, and, and he spoke out against it. And it was all part of the whole fabric of, of who he was as a Christian and as a bishop. Um, and it gave him a stronger voice, obviously, as a bishop, as a leader of the local church there. And because of that, obviously, he was a greater threat. Because Archbishop Oscar Romero was a public figure, his martyrdom grabbed worldwide attention. In fact, his funeral, which attracted more than 250,000 mourners, is considered the largest public demonstration in El Salvadorian history. But we must remember, for every martyr we do know about, there are perhaps thousands we don't. We should let the thoughts of these people who sacrifice their lives in anonymity also be a source of inspiration within our faith. I'm Carolyn Morrison, and I will see you next time on Mysteries of the Church. Thank you.